All right. So I want to talk about a topic that's come up a couple of times in the last couple of days, actually. So I'm sure it's probably on the minds of different people here. And the topic is learning how to learn. And honestly, this is probably one of the most important things I've personally learned in my life. Because when you learn how to learn effectively, that means you can pretty much pick up any skill and accelerate your learning curve so that you're able to get results faster with that particular skill. So for example, for me in my personal life in the past year and a half, it's all about, it's been all about salsa and Spanish. And it's interesting because these are new skills for me, right? I guess in Spanish, I, I took some classes in high school, but could barely speak coming out of high school, to be honest. Uh, so I was essentially starting almost from scratch or like a beginner level. And salsa, I was definitely at a beginner level. I had never danced salsa in my life before, except for one time at a party where um, a girl I was dating, uh, she invited me to, to her her family party and then they're dancing salsa because you know she's colombian so um that's sort of honestly that was one of the impetus <clears throat> that was part of the impetus for me wanting to learn in the first place is because since I, i've been living in colombia and latin america and mexico as well and um <clears throat> it's very common to, to dance salsa here i want to be able to have that ability now the question is how did i actually go about learning these things and honestly, it's very similar to how I learned pickup. It's very similar to how I went through my journey in entrepreneurship as well, uh, how I started working online. It has all these similar patterns. So I want to break down what are the first principles of learning? Because like I said, once you master that, once you have your own process that you can continually go back to and you can learn any skill from that process, then that's when I believe the rubber really hits the road or meets the road. And you're essentially able to step into any aspect of your life and accelerate your ability to get outcomes that you're seeking uh, immediately, or not necessarily immediately, but uh, in a in a faster time frame, more efficiently, right? So I have some notes here. I'm just going to go through and, and talk about each of these points. But let me let me actually just talk from from the top of my head here, and I'm going to walk through essentially maybe my process in learning salsa. Right, because I was starting from zero last February, um, had never really taken a salsa class. Uh, I remember my first class, I felt kind of lost. I was barely stepping, not knowing what to do. And I was kind of just trying to follow along and figure it out. So, um, so I remember I showed up and the first thing I did was I took some introductory classes, some private classes with the instructor. And I just jumped in and honestly, here's one thing is I just jumped in, so I saw uh, a post in a Facebook group that, or a WhatsApp group that I'm in. And they were talking about, Hey, I recommend this also teacher. So the first thing, actually, let me rewind a little bit. The first thing I actually did was set the intention for learning salsa. I remember I wrote that in my vision doc back in 2021 for the year 2022. And I knew that for some reason in my intuition, my gut and my heart, I felt like I wanted to learn salsa that year which was last year, right? 2022. And so I, I wrote that down that attention and suddenly near the beginning of the year, coincidentally or serendipitously, but honestly, it's not even coincidental because this is how the universe works. You write something down, you set an intention and it starts to deliver. I, I looked into a WhatsApp group that I'm in and it's a WhatsApp group for like online business owners in, in Medellin. And uh, they were posting, I think it was online business owners. It was one of those groups and they posted um, about how they had taken salsa classes from this teacher and they highly recommended her. She was, they said she was really good. So I was like, okay, let me reach out to her because I, I'm, I've been, that was one of the things I wrote down on my, on my vision doc. So I reached out to her, scheduled a class, went to class, started taking classes with her for, out, for, for about a month. Um, I moved to a different neighborhood about a month later and then started taking classes with another professor for a little bit, then went back to the same neighborhood I was in before and resumed my classes with this other professor. Um, now, here's the first step is number one, set the attention. Number two is just jump in. And for me, the fastest way of jumping in has been just hiring a, a teacher or a coach to just say, hey, you know, I, I wanna pay for some of your time. Just show me what to do, right? In the past, I remember I used to go on YouTube and try to search uh, how do you dance salsa? And these that can certainly work as well. And it depends on what skill you're learning. Uh, sometimes that can be an effective approach. But usually, for me, I would rather shortcut it a little bit 
And the way I shortcut it is just by paying for someone's time. And I still do this, right? Last year, I paid for a couple of relationship coaches. I paid for a life coach. I paid for business coaching, uh, especially at the beginning of this year. I paid for a few different business coaches. And basically, I just go on and and uh, sometimes what I'll do is, you know, first of all, I'll, I'll see if they already offer coaching because it's very easy to, to just pay and, and book a time. Um, but if they don't, then I just reach out to them. I'm like, do you have an hourly rate for one-on-one -on -one coaching? Or I'll make them an offer. Right? I'll just say, hey, look, I'm willing to pay you this much for an hour of your time. I just want to, you know, I, I want, I'm looking for help in this specific area. And so that for me, um, that's honestly how I do it, right? Uh, of course, you know, as a coach, I see the value in coaching, but I actually implement that as well in my, my personal life. So um, that's something that I do. And so basically to resume the story about Spanish or salsa, I, I jumped in and I basically took some initial introductory classes with her, private classes. And then as soon as I had the foundations down, I immediately went out and tried to do it. And that's usually the most intimidating step for people, right? So the equivalent in, in pickup is going out and actually doing approaches. For, for salsa, it's going out to a salsa social and asking girls to dance. And in the beginning, there is a period where it feels super embarrassing uh, or it can feel super embarrassing where you, you, you basically go up to a girl. It, it's honestly, I was, I was intimidated, right? I, I have all this pickup experience, but I was still, you know, I, I kind of like that actually though, because it, it makes you sharp and feel alive where, you know, you have to just jump into the deep end and start doing it. But basically I showed up to a salsa social and I was asking girls to, to dance and, um, you know, I was just barely making it through the song. I was making mistakes and I could tell sometimes the girls weren't necessarily having a great time. They're kind of like, you know, what is this guy doing? Um, but the important part is I just jumped in because I knew that the, the getting that first 20 hours of experience in is critical. The faster you can get those first 20 hours. So outside of classes uh, in the social environment, um, if you can just jump in and go in field as quickly as possible, that's the key. Right. So I knew that from my experience with pickup, from my experience with entrepreneurship sales, um, from my experience in different areas of my life, I have this, this process and pattern for learning. I knew that what I need to do is get that experience as quickly as possible. Right. Another thing that I did is when I had classes with my teacher, I would record myself. And so I literally have, I think over a hundred recordings of myself dancing salsa from the very beginning until now. And recording is super valuable. It's actually, it's not over a hundred. It's um, be around 70, 60 or 70, somewhere around there. Um, but it's, it's really valuable because you can watch yourself and you start to make self corrections just subconsciously, right? Because you observe, Hey, you know, actually I should move my feet this way, or I should do this, or I should do that. Now I, I know I talk about how sometimes you just make a lot of external corrections and you don't really work on the inner belief. Now, this is how it's different is I think with when you're observing yourself, when you're watching yourself back, I think it happens almost subconsciously. And there's a lot of value to that as well. And the key here's how, where the inner belief comes into play. Okay. So over time, so first, when you first watch yourself back, it's almost cringy, right? It's almost cringy. And that's your inner belief. That's where your inner belief is coming into play. You start judging yourself. You start thinking to yourself, man, you know, I don't look very good. But as you progress, what happens is you start to almost acquire taste to watching yourself back and you almost start to enjoy watching yourself back. So usually what happens is at first it feels cringy. Then you get to a point where you're sort of getting desensitized to it and you feel neutral about it. And then what happens is you actually start enjoying watching it back. And that's where there's an inner belief shift. And I think this is what a lot of guys, they don't even really think about this so much, but this is something I noticed for myself is when I was making YouTube videos, for example, and I would watch myself back on camera at first, it was super cringy. I could barely, I didn't want to watch my videos at all, to be honest. Um, and then what eventually happened is I started to improve a little bit on camera, the way I talked, I worked a little bit more on my charisma and my eloquence, you know, the, the words that I was saying, the way I was expressing myself. And eventually it got to the point where 
I started to feel a little bit more neutral about it, where I could watch myself back and not criticize myself and be like, hey, that's, that's actually not so bad. And eventually I got to the point where I actually enjoyed watching my, my own videos, which is a, it's a weird meta sort of thing. It almost sounds arrogant, but I don't think it's arrogant. I think that's actually true confidence. When you can look at yourself and you watch yourself back and you're like, hey, that was actually pretty good. I like that. And you sort of, that's, that's when you turn the corner because imagine that, right? Now you have an intrinsic motivation to continue doing that because every time you film a video or in the salsa example, since you start to actually appreciate the way you look dancing salsa or the way you sound speaking Spanish, now that you appreciate that, you're going to do it more and more and more. Now the feedback loop has gone the opposite direction. So the key is you just need to make it past that initial period, right? Because what oftentimes happens is people watch themselves back, they'll judge themselves and they'll never want to do it again. Right. They'll watch themselves back dancing salsa be like, hey, that was, I don't know if I, you know, I don't look very good. I don't know if this is for me. If you stop there, then you haven't made it past the inflection point yet. The key is you keep going until you get to that inflection point to the point where you're actually appreciating how you look. And then from there, it becomes a lot easier because you're going to be more intrinsically motivated to do that action or take, to do that activity. I did the same thing with Spanish as well. I sounded, you know, I didn't like the way I sounded. I sounded cringy. I had an accent, a really thick <laughs> Spanish uh, accent in Spanish. And it was really, you know, so, and I've had some challenges here and there with, with the language. But as I continued and I practiced, I recorded myself, actually. I would listen back to the recordings. I, I found that it was getting better and better. I was becoming more fluid. It's, it was starting to sound a lot better. And I actually started to acquire a taste for the way I sounded in Spanish as well. And as a result, I felt more intrinsically motivated to go and talk to people in Spanish because I started to gain more confidence in myself and my ability to do that. And it's interesting because when your inner belief shifts in that regard, what ends up happening is your external reality starts to shift as well, where people will start complimenting you on that thing because it, it's essentially a reflection of your own inner belief. Right? They're reflecting how you already feel. Now, here's the thing is if you want to apply that to pick up, you can certainly do that. Right? If you do infield, if you record yourself, if you listen to yourself, and eventually you get to the point where you enjoy watching back your own infield, that's a reflection of you appreciating yourself. And when you appreciate yourself, other people will appreciate you. Then that's where momentum builds. So that's essentially the process. One of the processes that I use, I understand that maybe with, uh, with pickup or something like that, it can be difficult to get in field. So I understand that as well. Um, you can do field reports. That's, you know, I, I would say that's actually an important tool that you can utilize as well. Um, I think that in general, self-reflection or being able to have that, yeah, some, some medium of self-reflection where you're looking back on yourself and you're observing yourself can accelerate growth a lot. So like I said, just to recap here, number one is setting the intention. What is the vision for where you wanna go, right? What is it that you wanna do? For me, dancing salsa, where I look like an actual salsa dancer was a goal of mine or the vision or the intention of what I wanted, right? In Spanish as well, I wanted to be able to speak fluently, fluently with native speakers. That was essentially my, my vision or my outcome. And I knew that it's probably gonna take about a thousand days it's probably going to take about a thousand days to get there. For me, I'm close to halfway in that journey. Um, and it's just a matter of getting to the point where you intrinsically enjoy it. You have that intrinsic motivation to keep on doing it. For me, that I know for myself, that's where a corner usually turns. Because once I get to that point, it's, it, the process becomes a lot easier, right? Because in the beginning, it can be tough. Because if you keep receiving this feedback of, you know, you feel embarrassed because you don't look great. You don't sound great. I understand that that can be a tough period to go through, but it's just a matter of staying the course through that period. And just knowing that, look, that first 20 hours, that's where you're going to be doing the most learning. But that also means that you're, that's probably where you're going to be the most quote unquote cringy, right? You just have to go into it understanding that. And if you're able to let go of embarrassment and be like, okay, you know what? I'm not going to judge myself. I know that going into it, it's, it might not look great or sound great, but that's the expectation, right? So you put yourself in environments. And like I said, 
Um, that's why for me, I sometimes just hire a coach. That's another thing I talked about because it gets me through that period faster, right? It, it expedites because I know that once I get through that period, it's going to be, I, I'm going to have momentum in a direction that I want to head into. And so for me, if I'm able to have that accountability and also feedback to help me improve and see my blind spots and essentially uh, cut the learning curve as much as possible through that first period, then I can get to the point where finally I hit that inflection point and then I start feeling a lot better doing that activity, right? So uh, number one, intention. Number two, jumping in as quickly as possible, going out into the field, whatever the field is for your specific area, whether it's pickup, whether it's sales, right? For sales, it's just going out and talking to people, right? People are afraid to pick up the phone or knock on doors or whatever it is. But at the end of the day, that's what's going to get you results. The faster you do that, the faster you actually go out into the field and implement, the faster you're going to learn. And same thing with, um, with salsa and Spanish, right? It's about, you know, for salsa, going out to a social and asking girls to dance. Or if you're learning Spanish, then going out and talking to native speakers. You're going to have stumbling blocks. You're going to have um, things that come up where you feel awkward, you feel frustrated. But that's part of the process, especially in the beginning. And as you continue, as you progress, as you enjoy it more, the frustration becomes less and less. And the struggle, that feeling of struggle becomes less and less and it becomes, it, it flips from struggle to enjoyment. And once you hit that point, like I said, that's where you start to feel a lot more of that flow and you're able to keep it going a lot more. You, you have more of that intrinsic motivation to keep going. So those are the key things to keep in mind, I believe, when it comes to learning. Now, and then also recording yourself, right? Observing back if, if there is a way to do that. For sales, listening back to your past calls. For pickup, if you can record some infield. For salsa, you know, sometimes if you can record your classes or record when you're out at a social, sometimes if, you know, if the other person is okay with that, then you can have that recorded. Or um, for, for learning Spanish, I used to record myself every morning reading a book in Spanish, right? To, to work on my pronunciation, to work on the way I sounded. And, um, and that, for me, has accelerated a lot. Uh, my, my learning curve. And then of course, you know, field reports as well. Uh, I have sales field reports too, from when I was back in the day, when I was doing sales, I would observe how I felt. Here's a key thing with field reports as well is observing how you feel while you're doing that thing. So if it's pickup related, then it's about, for me, it's more about the, the way you feel, right? Because that's where everything, that's where everything else comes from anyway, is how you feel. If you feel good. So here's the thing is a lot of guys, They'll ask questions about how should I learn how to tease? How should I learn about breaking rapport? All these things. And what I noticed is I do those things naturally when I'm in a good mood, when I'm feeling good, right? Sometimes when you're feeling it, you, you do all the quote unquote right things naturally without even have to think what, without even having to think about it. So the key for me realizing that is thinking less about, okay, how do I just mimic these things? And more about how do I actually get to the cause, the core of what's causing these things. And what's causing these things is being in a good state, having good feelings, because when I'm, when I'm feeling good, then all the right words and all the right things and the right energy, it's going to come out naturally. So that was the question for me is how do I get into that, that place? And so that's why I actually write down in my field reports, okay, this is how I was feeling during this scenario. This is what was happening. This is, these are the thoughts that were coming up. And just through awareness over time, what ends up happening is you start to focus your attention more on how, how did I get, because inevitably you're going to have certain sessions where you just feel great. And then you start to look back and think about, okay, how did I get there? What were some of the inputs that led to that, that feeling of just feeling like you're in a good mood, like feeling like you're, you know, things are going well, that you're flowing. What were the inputs that, that led me to that outcome? And once you're able to, to discover what that is for you, it's almost like pushing your own buttons, right? I've heard that term before. Um, once you're able to figure out what that is for you, there's almost like a process that you can follow for yourself. And then you get into a pretty good mood. And eventually what happens is you just structure your life in that way. You structure your life so that your life is, so as you continue in your life, you're energized and you're in flow. 
And you set up your life in that way from the moment that you wake up to the moment that you go to bed. And usually the way I think about it is sure you can have a mo sure you can have a morning routine. Sometimes that helps as well. I have like a small morning routine uh, because I used to have a long one and I just realized that I was spending like a quarter of my day doing this morning routine, a quarter, a quarter of my waking hours. Right. And it was just too much. Uh, so for me, I just do a couple of things and, uh, and that helps me to, to get the day started where I'm just feeling good. You know, it doesn't have to be like you're jumping up and down. It could be if you want to do that. But for me, it's just even, you know, a couple of things like gratitude, practice of gratitude and visualization and I'm good. Right. You just, for me, that that's what works. Right. I, I do those couple of things and I'm good to go. And then the way I structure my day, the things that I have in my day are activities that I enjoy and that give me energy. And it took me time to get to that point where I had that ability to structure my day in that way, because there was definitely a time in my life where I was constantly working. There was a time in my life where I was working an office job. It's a lot more difficult to, to structure your day in that way. So you might be in that pos position. And I understand that. What I would recommend is number one, you set the intention, you write down what is it that you would want your day to look like if you had, if you were able to choose, right? What would the ideal day in your life, if you could ask for anything, what would the ideal day in your life look like from beginning to end? And then you write that down. Setting that attention, writing that down is super important. And here's the thing is that you might, when you, as you write it down, you might not even believe it's possible. I felt that way as well. I wrote down the details of, okay, I want to do this. This is what I want to do next. This, you know, this is what my ideal day would look like from the time I wake up to the time I go to bed. And this is how I would feel throughout the day. And like I said, it, it, I read it and it looked unbelievable. Unbelievable in the sense that I didn't think, I didn't believe that it would happen. I didn't believe that it would ever happen, right? But eventually what happens is when you write that down, that's in your subconscious. And then your focus and your RAS starts to shift so that eventually you start to see opportunities and you build it brick by brick over time, right? And it could happen in a matter of months sometimes. Sometimes it happens in the court in, in the matter of years but as long as you're able to hold that in your subconscious which it's, it doesn't require effort to do that as long as you write it down and you sort of have that north star for yourself you just chip away at it over time eventually you will get there eventually you will get there right just building it brick by brick and the key for me is how do i stay present throughout that process and that's why i have the gratitude practice as well because gratitude brings me back to the present Right. So when I practice gratitude, because think about it this way, if I'm grateful for my body, I'm grateful for my phone, I'm grateful for this water, this clean water that I get to drink, access to clean water, right? because there's literally, I think, over a billion people in the world that don't have access to clean water. It's something that sometimes we take for granted. These are all things that are in front of me that I can be grateful for in the present moment right now. It's not something that I'm projecting into the future. It's not something that I'm dwelling on in the past. It's something that's here right now that I can be present with in the moment. So it brings me back to the present moment. That's why for me, gratitude is like a muscle. You train it every single day and your perspective starts to shift. You see different opportunities. Your brain becomes more creative. And once again, you come back to the present moment. It brings you back to the present because a lot of people, you know, I think meditation is great. A lot of people, they ask themselves or they ask me, how do you become more present? And uh, meditation, of course, is usually the default answer. And I think meditation can be a great practice. What also works for me is gratitude, right? And I think sometimes people overlook it, but for me, that, that actually really works. I'm, I'm a very, for me, when I write things down, as you can tell when, as I'm talking about this, I'm sure you could already hear this, that, you know, I write down my vision, I write down my intentions, I might write down what I'm grateful for. For some reason, for me in particular, the process of taking pen to paper and writing things down has, that's what's most effective for me, right? Uh, so that's why I write out my vision and I also write out what I'm grateful for. I think there's something where there's like a brain connection that happens when you actually write it out. Uh, so that's, that's my personal process. Now, when it comes back to how to learn effectively. So I already talked about setting the intention. I talked about, you know, if you can get feedback from someone, I understand though, you might not be in a position right now where you can actually hire a coach or, or pay someone to just give you feedback. So that's why I also talk about recording yourself. I talk about self-reflection. Um, and then also one other thing, one other really important thing is visualization. This is a secret 
I mean, it's not a secret anymore because I'm telling you, but um, this is actually a, a very underrated part of, for me, what I found has been a, a major part of my success. Um, I would say over half of it has been through visualization because you know, we talked about this recently on a call and uh, someone brought up how we all visualize anyway, right? We're all visualizing anyway. And at the end of the day, why not be intentional about our visualization? Here's the realization that I came to is, you know, athletes, of course, in sports, especially in professional sports, a lot of athletes use visualization. Right? A lot of athletes use this because for professional athletes, they're thinking about anything that gives me an advantage, I'm going to use it. And I actually got an opportunity to speak with uh, one of the speakers at, at an event and he was a professional athlete. And I was really fortunate because uh, me and my friend, we caught him in the elevator and we ended up having dinner with him. It was just me, my friend and, and the speaker, right? And uh, we were just having dinner and he was talking about visualization like almost the entire time. Um, and I connected with him on that because I had actually been using visualization myself initially in high school sports. And then I, uh, I used it when I was in pickup as well, because I thought to myself, okay, well, here's the thing. There's this period in, in Vegas where I was sort of in a slump. And what I mean by that, I was sort of in a dry spell. So basically I was going out, having the same conversations over and over, you know, just nothing was really happening every time I, I went out. And this was about, you know, a month of a dry spell. And what I ended up doing was I thought to myself, okay, well, I need to try something, right? I obviously need to, to change up my strategy a little bit, try something new. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, well, what about visualization? Because I remember in high school, I used to visualize or our coach made us visualize for sports. And so if that supposedly works for sports, then why wouldn't it work for pickup or something like that? So that's why I started doing it is because I, I told myself, why not give it a shot? Because right now I'm going through a bit of a slump, a dry spell. So I'm going to give it a shot. So I committed myself. I think initially it was 30 days. I ended up doing for, for like 45 to 60 days. I, I just kept doing it. But about 30 days into the process where I was basically just taking 10 minutes every single night, right? Every single night. And usually uh, right before I went out or yeah, it was during a period where I was going out pretty much every single night. So I'll do it pretty much every single night before I went out for about 10 minutes, just lay down, close my eyes, visualize what I wanted to do. And that was it. And a lot of people have a lot of questions on this. It's not that complicated. Just close your eyes and visualize what you want to happen. Right. And then you can tweak it over time, but just start there. Just start somewhere. You don't have to do it perfectly. Um, you know, over time, you'll start to refine your own process, but just get started with it. And so for me, I did that 30, 30 days into it. Out of nowhere, I started polling consistently. And this is actually where the 10 minute poll initially came from. This is where I started getting 10 minute polls was through visualization. And then later on, I actually had to backwards deconstruct what I was doing to figure out the system and the process so I could uh, understand it myself and also teach it to others. Uh, but it actually came through visualization initially. And, and so that for me is, is a key component. It also happened in sales. So a few years later, I'd gone into sales, maybe it was a couple of years later. And I remember I was also in about a month worth of a, a slump, a sales slump, right? And I hadn't gotten a sale in about a month. I committed myself. I told myself, okay, well, look, it worked for pickup. Why wouldn't it work for sales as well? It's a very similar process, right? So I just, I would do that every time before my calls, I would close my eyes and visualize for five to 10 minutes how I, you know, when the prospect would come on the phone, how I would greet them, what we would say, um, what I would say in the middle. And then I also visualize the close, uh, basically the emotional state as well, right? The emotional state of the close, feeling calm. I'd visualize objections coming up. I'd visualize me reframing them and I would visualize the, um, just saying like Visa or MasterCard. And they basically just say their credit card number in my visualization. And about a month later, so another month. So this is like two months. I, you know, I still kind of had a slump. It was maybe it was like three weeks later. I finally got a, a close to end my dry spell. And the week after that, I got four closes. Just, I mean, you can, you can say it's woo woo. You can say, you know, it's out there, but it, for me, it just works. So I don't really judge it. I just try different things. I experiment with different things and I just take what works and I keep it. 
So I don't care how woo woo it is. If it gets me results, then why not just continue doing it? So that's the way I approach it. So once again, so visualization is one of the key components for me learning how to learn, right? When I, so I, I also with, with salsa, I visualize, I visualize myself, what I would look like. I visualize myself in the third person, what I would, what I would see myself looking like, you know, I watch other salsa dancers, how they, how they move. And I visualize myself moving that way. And same thing with Spanish. I, I visualize myself speaking Spanish with, with, with fluency. And over time, what happens is your visualization converges with reality. So that the boundaries actually are almost imperceptible until the point, until you get to the point where they become non-existent and your reality becomes your visualization and vice versa. So that's how I see it. It's worked in my life. So I just continue that process It's worked for me. Why not keep doing that? And if I do find places where I can refine the process or improve upon it, then I will, but this is just what's worked, you know? So, so anytime I learn a new skill, I go through the same process, right? Uh, if I'm learning a new instrument, for example, I'll just jump in and try to start playing, but I'll probably have to take a few introductory lessons, just know enough. This is actually how I learned guitar was I had a, a CD that had like enough introductory uh, teachings for me to be able to play a few basic songs. And then from there, I would just find tabs online, uh, basically the music online or chords so I could learn how to play these, these songs, right? And then I'll just learn more and more songs. So I mostly learned through an experience. I didn't really learn so much through uh, videos or through um, taking formal, too many formal classes uh, because that, that was in high school when I learned guitar. So it wasn't necessarily, a, you know, that, that's basically the way I did it. But anyway, so hopefully this is helpful. And I think that wherever, whatever you're learning right now, whatever journey you're on, and most likely if you're, if you're watching this and you're probably on some sort of journey of improving in some area of your life, I would maybe take some of these things and start applying it and think about how it applies to your particular situation. So once again, hope this helps and I'll talk to you later. Take care.